Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This is our virtual speaker series, Spotlighting Deaf and Hard of Hearing Healthcare Professionals. This series is brought to you by the Healthcare System Transformation Project at the Rhode Island Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. My name is Christine West, and I'm the project manager for HSTP. And joining me today is Sarah Hine, a registered nurse, uh, currently working at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Let's start off uh, with learning a little bit about who you are, uh, your background, where you grew up, and how it is that you came to the nursing profession. Uh, what were some of the uh, barriers that you were able to overcome? And um, why don't we start with that? Okay, well, that's already like a pretty long story right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I actually lost my hearing when I was about two years old. I was sick. I think it was um, scarlet fever or German needles. They're not really sure. I have a brother that's part of hearing as well. He's the only other person in my family, so I'm not like a fifth generation deaf or anything like that. It's just me and him. Um, anyway, my whole family went into business and I'm my ad ducked out that decided to go into medicine. <laughs> um, my mom said that when I was really young, um, probably four or five years old, I said that I wanted to be a skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> but she said from there on out, I was really interested in the human body and medicine, how the body was in science and that was always my best subject in school. I would, um, went to early intervention when I was three, and then I went mainstream all the way through. I didn't go to any deaf school. Um, not, my parents just didn't know at the time in the 80s about deaf culture. Um, they did try to expose me with the little information that they had, but not a lot of information was given back then by the doctors and professionals. So they did try to expose me, but I never got that connection until I went to college. I went to the University of Michigan. Um, I was pre-med. I wanted to be a doctor. I had both advisor in college and she told me to basically go on to research because she didn't think that deaf and hard of hearing people could make it in medicine. And I was just very young and naive and hurt at that time. And um, I listened and I did end up going into a neuroscience research. So I graduated from Paris, jumped right into graduate school, which actually getting my PhD in neuroscience. Um, but then it wasn't really my thing. So I left with a master's degree and um, ended up working at University of Michigan for a couple of years in a lab as a senior lab technician. So I ran the lab. Um, I also was um, involved with publishing a paper with that lab, but just wasn't my passion. Um, I decided to try to try again and take the MCAT, apply for medical school. But I guess I just didn't have that competitive edge that they're looking for. And I hate to say it, there's already a stigma against people like me trying to go into the medical field. Um, even though I don't really disclose my deafness on my application for school and job, they're able to find out somehow. Even like more so now because I'm more well known in the community and where I live right now, because people know, oh, she's that deaf girl. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I tried that medical school route. It didn't really work out. My grandma actually was a surgical nurse back in the day, like, you know, back in that day. <laughs> um, so she would always tell me to go into nursing that it was her most rewarding experience. She loved it. I guess I'll try it. So I did an accelerated nursing program. Um, got my own about five years ago. 
and I've been a nurse for about five years now. I started in orthopedics and then I switched to critical care. Um, and now I have report where I currently work, I do two things. I work in the community uh, where I do flu shots and health screening to try to um, help the people in the community better understand like why BMI is important, why is blood pressure important, why do they need to go to the doctor. And then I also work at the hospital um, where I float to different departments. Wherever they need me, I just float. Um, and I'm also almost, almost done with my nurse practitioner program at University of Michigan. I will be done in August. I'm hoping to step up step and take my board exam in September and get my license and be an MP in the fall. <laughs> yeah. Yes, as I was saying, um, my, my husband is also an RN and he's pursuing his nurse practitioner degree as well. So I'm curious what uh, specialty for a uh, nurse practitioner, family nurse practitioner or gerontology or have you decided on a specialization yet? When you become a, a nurse practitioner? When you go into a nurse practitioner program, you have to pick a specialty right at the beginning. I talked to a lot of people and they told me to go for family because that gave you the um from zero to 100. So you get the experience of all the ages. Mm -hmm. If I just did pediatrics, I would be stuck in pediatrics. So I have that wide range. So if later I want to go and just do pediatrics, I can do that. If I get sick of that and I just want to do elderly people, then I can do that. So I got that very vain. Great, great. Yeah, your background is, is really diverse. As you were saying, you have your bachelor's in brain behavior and cognitive sciences. Um, then you got your master's in neuroscience and then a second bachelor's in nursing and now uh, a master's of science in nursing uh, as a future nurse practitioner. Um, where do you get your drive from? Where do you get your energy and your drive um, to have accomplished all of these things uh, so far? Where, where does that stem from? Well, I have to say from my family because my parents never wanted me to give up. When I was two, and the whole process was, I would rather definitely to give up and out that whole process. The doctors were telling my parents that I would just be a janitor or a mailman. And um, my parents, they're just very stubborn and they wouldn't accept that. And um, they've always pushed me, like they put me in the early intervention. Then I was in the best school district wherever we lived. And then my mom always made sure I had the, the correct teacher. Like I couldn't have a teacher that didn't care. I had to have the teacher that put you. And then um, when I went to high school, I actually went to a private Catholic school because I wanted that extra push. So just having my family give me that push and then it kind of um, taught myself how to push myself. I also have like, a lot of great friends that are very motivational and they can also give me that push. I like to associate with myself with people that are very motivated and dedicated. I know how people that aren't kind of bring you down. Mm -hmm. So I like to have that motivation and I'm like, oh yeah, I can do it, you know? So I, I have to thank my family. Mm -hmm. that's, that's wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, it sounds like um, growing up, there weren't a lot of role models available who were themselves deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it can be hard to, you know, there's that phrase, you know, you can't be it unless you see it. Um, so I'm wondering about um, the first time that you encountered other deaf and hard of hearing healthcare professionals and what kind of impact that had on you. Um, and who were some of your current role models now? Um, so, I would say I grew up with my brother with a tight of hand, so he was, you know. But other than that, I didn't really see a lot of deaf with hard of hearing people. 
my brother did have a hard of hearing friend that we all grew up together, but it wasn't really until college that I had that exposure, and it was kind of shocking for me, like a culture shock, because you grow up in the hearing world, but you're not really fit in, and then you meet these people that are kind of like you, and you're like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be. <laughs> So when I went to college, I had um, a disability advisor named Joan Smith. Um, she's retired now. She introduced me to Philip Dadjaw, who is the chair of family medicine at University of Michigan. He's a deaf doctor. I'm sure you've heard of him. Yes, Dr. Zazov. Is that Z A Z O V E? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yes. So um, he's been my mentor on and off since 2003. And um, I still talk to him, not as frequent as he, you know, kind of retired and I'm like shooting off on my career. Uh, then I met um, Dr. Michael McKee, which I'm sure you know as well. I didn't meet him until a couple of years ago, but he's been helping me now in my journey because he's in family medicine. So I kind of asked him, you know, like, what should I do in this area and give me advice. Um, I also joined the Association of Medical Professionals for Hearing Losses. I was actually on the board for four or five years. I can't remember. I was a secretary. So I know a lot of people on that board and those that have retired and those that go to campuses. So um, they're my mentors as well. I also, in the state of Michigan, I have two friends, Diane Bass and Joe Simona. Joe's a dentist and Diane is working on her board of them to become an RN. They're both deaf. And we set up an organization called Michigan Deaf Health, which is kind of like what you're doing in Rhode Island, but we just haven't gotten that far yet. But we're trying to help um, the deaf community in Michigan better understand how to take charge of their health. We also want to help deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind youth get into a STEM field, because there's not a lot of us and there should be more. So I think that answers your question. I'm hoping. I kind yeah. of not. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, so Sarah, can you talk a little bit about the benefits of having uh, deaf and hard of hearing healthcare professionals in the field to have representation? What are the benefits for the deaf and hard of hearing community to see that, um, but also the greater hearing community to be able to see that? Could you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I think the first thing I have to say is that having deaf and hard of hearing uh, medical professionals is beneficial to everyone because um, we're very observant and we're very persistent. Um, we can see things that hearing providers may not pick up on because we're very visual people. We're always watching the fear, watching what's going on. Like I've gone into patient rooms with doctors and I see something wrong and I'm like, oh, we're going to check on that doctor because I didn't get to that. Mm -hmm. So it's just little things like that because we have a perception. So we can be really helpful in that way. We also have um, like a unique outlook on life because we were brought up in discrimination and we had all these obstacles. So we know how to overcome those, and we're able to help people overcome. It doesn't matter if they're deaf or hard of hearing or hearing. We can help boost people up that way. Um, a lot of my patients like me better than their hearing nurses because I'm willing to sit down and listen. And I think part of the reason they say that is because I have to lip read. So I have to like sit down and really focus on them while the hearing nurses can just kind of walk around and do whatever. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they're not listening, but they are. Mm -hmm. So my staff patients think I'm a really, I'm sorry, my patients think I'm a really good listener because I'm always really focused on them. <laughs> As for the deaf and hard of hearing population, I feel like that 
we need more we need, we need more doctors there that we need more micro machines because they don't they don't trust the health system because of the communication barrier and um the gap they fall through the gap all the time because there's no interpreter but there's no closed caption in the house material or it's not written in a way that they can understand or the doctor doesn't take the time to explain why they're getting the prescription that they're getting. Um, so I think having myself, even though I'm not fluent in ASL, I'm able to communicate having patients on ASL. I'm able to get across to that deaf and hard of hearing patient because I can communicate with them in that way. And I can probably get more information from that patient than a hearing doctor or a nurse might get. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of benefits. Yes, absolutely. And I think maybe you hit on uh, one of the most important benefits uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing community, which is this idea of trust. Um, yes. As you said, you're willing, you're able to get more information from them, and I'm sure a large part of that has to do with trusting somebody mm -hmm. uh, and how important that is uh, in healthcare. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, could you possibly share um, just some experiences that you may have had? Um, have you had any experiences in the hospital working with doctors? Um, I know sometimes there's that interesting relationship between doctors and nurses. Um, any challenges that you've experienced um, working with doctors or working with other staff members who may or may not understand uh, your particular communication needs on the job? And if so, how do you provide that kind of education to them? And how do you have those kinds of conversations with them? Um, I guess I could start off with a funny little story. Um, when I had my first pulp group, I was terrified. But um, the nurses on my floor at that time, I think it was my first year of nursing, um, they said that I have really good documentation. I'm always writing everything down. So the word really like my documentation. So um, in a cold blue, the doctor quickly has to make a team. Mm -hmm. And you have to decide like, who's going to be the guy, who's going to be doing compression, who's doing whatever. So they like pull me to the front and they're like, there's going to be the guy. <laughs> and I'm like, me? Really? Mind you, in the cold blue, you have the doctor yelling. You have um, whoever's doing the compression is counting. There's like 20, 30 people in the room, so it's like really, really chaotic. And they're all looking at me to start taking notes. And I quickly had to just be like, here, you take it. I'm going to do medicine. And I just passed it. <laughs> so that, I, I try to figure out that story because, um, People just make assumptions because they think that with me, especially because I talk, they think that I can hear more than I can hear, but I really can't. Mm -hmm. So that's what people like me who talk and look, we, we often run into that problem with how doctors or nurses or other staff were assuming because we talk and we're fine going back and forth that we can hear everything. So sometimes that can cause problems. And so um, I've had some doctors and some other staff yell at me completely because I didn't hear an order or I don't understand what they wanted. Um, and obviously that's very disheartening. It hurts when you call it out and tell everybody. Um, what I learned in those cases is that you have to have an ally on your floor. You have to find like, someone you can trust as a manager or your nursing supervisor or maybe someone in Asia that you can go to and just say, hey, this happened. It wasn't really cool. What do you think I should do about it? Um, it doesn't mean you have to go and get Dr. So-and-so in trouble. It just means that 
and we put them into that and say it wasn't really good. You don't want it to happen again to yourself or someone else. And when I first started at the nurse, I just kept quiet. I didn't really tell people when people were being discriminatory or mean. But then I was like, no, I need to stand up for myself. I need to make sure that they don't do that. So um, usually I'll just find someone that I can trust and confide in. And usually um, there would be some kind of a meeting where the doctor would come and say, hey, I don't need to do that. It was the heat of the moment. I'm sorry. So sometimes it just takes those little meetings to help educate people. Sometimes I have to get up in front of the entire unit and say, hey, I'm deaf. I can't really hear you all the time. Sorry. <laughs> um, usually the managers on the unit are very helpful. So help me announce it so that people aren't you know, mean about it. I really haven't had that many problems. Um, usually everybody's pretty up, um, accepting. If something happened, it usually is just, they just don't know. It's the clueless. Um, for example, my phone, I have a smartphone and I use the IP relay app. And then I'll, my hospital actually switched to um, a test based system so we can all test each other, which is like so awesome. But right now, I think it's just the doctors and the nurses and, and some of the therapists that can test. So we're kind of trying to get everybody on there, like the nurse and assistant, the pharmacy, everybody, so we can just test each other and not have to call each other anymore. Nice. That's been a godsend. <laughs> but the, the whole phone thing can be quite confusing because people are like, why is Sprint calling me? I'm trying to talk to Sarah. <laughs> so I just have to explain it. Like, and then people are like, oh, I'm okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> and then I never really had um, a lot of problems with patients. A lot of times the patients are just like, whatever, well, I don't care. Just makes me feel better. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked a little bit about using texting for communication. And I'm curious about some of the other um, ways in which you communicate other than texting and also some of the specialized equipment that you might use uh, as a registered nurse. Um, for those folks who may be watching um, and may want to become nurses in the future and are wondering how, how does that work? Uh, what about a stethoscope? What about uh, blood pressure? Can you speak a little bit about some of the specialized equipment that you use? Okay, sure. Um, so I start with a stethoscope. If you go on the AMPHL website, they actually have a comparison table where you can look at the different kinds of stethoscopes. I think there's only four of them right now out for the different part of the year. Um, the challenge with a stethoscope is not everybody has the same kind of hearing aid. Some people have a hearing aid here and a cochlear implant here. Some people don't use anything at all. Some people want headphones. Some people want earplugs. Some people want this, you know, it goes on and on and on. So um, you kind of have to just play with it and figure it out. At the NPHL conferences, we usually try to have like a table where you can test out the different stethoscopes and try to figure out what can work for you. I started with a Litman stethoscope because it's supposed to be the best brand in the whole field, you know? Um. I thought it was great for a beginning as a nurse because it gives you that amplification and then you just put them in your ears. The only annoying thing I have to say is I put my hearing aid out, put stand in, and then take that off, put my hearing aid back in. The whole pattern. Right now I have this lab, which I really like because it's louder. Um, I can adjust the frequency so if I want to make it more quiet or more um, loud, and I can do that. They also, I think they have an app for iPhone where you can see like the visual reading. I haven't figured that one out yet, <laughs> but I will. <laughs> so with the stethoscope, you kind of have to play around with it and figure out what was with the auditory needs. Some um, ENTs and audiologists know how to play with your hearing aids. 
Um, I will recommend for anybody that has hearing aids to make sure that you have Bluetooth in the hearing aids because the new stethoscopes that are coming out can care with the Bluetooth and um, you can actually have it go to your hearing aid so that you get that extra boost and clarity. So that's what I plan to do with my next set of hearing aids. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> um, other technology. Um, I talk about my phone. It's just a smartphone. My boss has let me download all the apps that I want for communication. When I first started five years ago, um, I worked at night. And most of that time when you work at night, you're working with medical residents. So the younger doctors and I guess, you know, more in tune with technology. So a lot of these younger doctors just wanted to test me. They didn't want to call me. So they made that decision on their own. They just texted me to like, hey, I want you to go see bye bye, blah blah blah. I was like, okay, cool, whatever. Um as far as other communication, I don't really use a lot. Right now, I'm actually working with my hospital system on getting a mask because of the whole pandemic right now. Mm-hmm. I'm fortunate to pay a mask that I'm back with in front of all. So all of us that my heart is being um, provided and nurses and whatnot are struggling to get those right now so that we can work to go back to work. Um, there's other technology that people use. Some people use sign language interpreters. I know Dr. Chris Morland and Tester actually had the interpreter that works with him and they do like, um, they can do code blues with interpreters. I, we had a process one at one of the conferences and it was awesome. I understood everything. Yeah, I think we may be interviewing uh, Dr. For, Dr. Christopher Moreland from Texas uh, as a part of this virtual speaker series. So yes, I'm interested in hearing more about he and his interpreter and how do they uh, how they handle code blues. But please continue, continue. Um, one thing that I want to implement when I become an MP is that Dr. McKee Ruder, he had a five. Because, you know, as a provider, we have to go in and look at our patient history, we do it in a dam, and then the whole thing is done in 20 minutes. It's kind of hard at the heart of hearing a deaf individual to pay attention to that patient and get all the notes down very quickly. So I'm hoping that when I get my first job, I can have a scribe and that person can take the notes to me so that I can just focus with my patient. Especially if they're deaf and hard of hearing, because I want to be able to do sign language as well. And I can't do that while I'm trying to type on a computer. Right. Wow. Um, you talked a little bit about masks and COVID-19 um, and the fact that they're on back order, but I can imagine that the use of masks um, as a hard of hearing individual must cause some difficulty in being able to um, understand communication amongst staff uh, and also patients as well. So I was wondering if you could speak about that. And also in regards to COVID-19, um, what has been your experience so far at the hospital with COVID? Um, and is that a part of your work um, on a day-to-day basis as a registered nurse? Okay, um, I'm trying to be positive as much as I can about this. I actually haven't been working since April because um, I decided, I, I talked to my manager at the hospital because when the pandemic first started at the end of March, uh, we started with the mask and the shield and the full PPE. And I was extremely frustrated. Mm-hmm. I worked probably two days that week and I just went home crying because I couldn't get what people were saying. I will say the people that I work with, they liked me a lot and they were kind and they would pull down the mask so that I could try to read their lips or they would test for me what the patient said. Or I had to read it. Like what I really hated about that experience was I had a patient that was dying mm. and um, I couldn't communicate with the family properly because of the mask. I had to call them on the phone so that I could have the um, subtitle so that I could understand what they were saying. It was just really heartbreaking. 
mm-hmm. but I couldn't talk to them normally. I also couldn't give them a hug and say we can't hug anybody again. It was just a really hard business day. And I've been in touch with fellow Dr. Hard hearing nurses and doctors and students. And we are struggling right now. I'm trying to stay positive because obviously I want all of us to have a job or get a job or whatever it is. Um, we're perfectly capable of doing that. We just need that extra accommodation. So I did work with my hospital with the ADA coordinator, and that's the advice I have to give to every deaf and hard of hearing person that's struggling right now with the pandemic is to go right to the ADA coordinator at your hospital or the clinic or wherever you work. And because they're well versed in the ADA and they know that they have to give you something. The other advice that I have is to make sure you do research. There's different options. It's not just a clear map. It's a good interpreter. You need to use the auto app. There's all these voice transcribing apps out there. You can try that. Um, you can try the tears, like the full helmet. You know. um, but you have to be very persistent about it. You can't give up. And you have to be very positive. So, Although I was very angry about not being able to work because I wanted to be that fun time here. You know, this is my career. This is what I'm called to do. And I couldn't do it because mm-hmm. I was a man. So my best advice is just to stay positive. Don't give up. Talk to the ADA coordinator. Make sure that you know you're right. And just keep trying. I'm hoping to go back soon. I'm not worried. They actually um, taking the time off of work, gave me the time to finish up school. So it kind of worked out for me. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that it works out for all of my friends and colleagues out there as well. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's shift a little and talk about two things, nursing school and also medical school. Um, I'm wondering what advice you have for uh, deaf, hard of hearing individuals who are considering either, whether it's nursing school or medical school, um, your specialty is nursing. Um, some of the other folks that we've spoken with um, are in the medical profession as doctors. Um, but what advice would you have for um, those individuals who are considering a career in either? Um, and uh, what are some words of wisdom for them? Well, my first thing is don't give up. You're going to have a lot of people tell you that you can't. Mm-hmm. I had that, and I bet I might be tired of the journey. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you really want something, you should go for it. I for listening in medical field, um, a lot of people will tell you, oh, no, you can't do that because of the high energy field, like the ER, for example. I know definitely how to be people that work in the ER and they do just that. They found accommodations that work for them and they do wonderful work in those areas. So I, my um, advice right there is to not limit yourself. Don't just go into no offense to them as how do. No offense. Don't go into dermatology because you think you need to go into a quiet little clinic or whatever. Mm-hmm. If you want to have a high energy trauma and work in the ER and have the blood and the gut and stuff, go for it. <laughs> I actually, um, later down the road, if it happened, I wouldn't mind um, doing flight nursing. You know, when you go up in the helicopter and you know, um, help transport the patient to the hospital. So I don't know any deaf or hard of hearing people that do that. And it would be probably a battle to get there. But if it, if my passion down the line, then I'm gonna go for it. Yeah. Um, let me see what other kind of advice. I said school, make sure that you fight for your accommodation. My best recommendation for school and I know there's not um, 
a cover art for everybody, but my best recommendation is to use color for your lectures, which is a real-time capture. Because your lectures are going to go better than this. They're so bad. They're really, really fast-paced. Um, the advantage of color is it's verbatim, so you have everything that goes down verbatim, and then the email is going to explain it. So you can go back and read it again. My classmates were always very jealous about that. <laughs> and then um, my other recommendation for your classes in nursing or medical school is if you have lab, like anatomy lab or whatever, I suggest having an interpreter if you know sign language. I'm going to the professor likes to move around a lot. They're always moving. Mm -hmm. And when you have a lab, you're moving yourself because you have a cut up the cadaver or whatever. So it's kind of awkward to try to put that heart person in the room when you're trying to cut someone's body. And I realized that not everybody knows sign numbers. There's two speech interpreters, there's voice interpreters, there's a voice transcribing app. I don't know if some people that went to medical school when they did their surgery rotation, they use a tablet with a trans, like Dragon software or something. They just put it up on the, um, the thing. And whenever the doctor said anything, they looked at the, the caption and they were able to see what the doctor said. Another thing is in the surgery room, you can also get the, um, the markers and you can write right on the stair field. So I've heard that people do that as well. So you can go into surgery if you're deaf and hurt in here and you shouldn't be afraid of that. So I guess my point is you can go anywhere you want and just have to figure out what kind of accommodation you're going to do. And you shouldn't back down when people tell you to back down. You should do what you want to do. That's great advice. Um, let's see. Um, You talked a little bit about the ADA and accommodations, and we know right now we're celebrating the 30-year anniversary of the signing of the ADA. Did you want to add anything about um, how this landmark legislation has helped you in your career and uh, has helped you get to where you are? Okay. Well, my mom and my, my dad became well-versed in the ADA when it passed in 1990. Um, I had to remember the year. <laughs> um, and then they passed it on to me. So it was always my mom and my dad telling me, remember what your rights are. If you know what your rights are, you can fight for what you want. So I um, always like, looked at the website or and looked up in the book or whatever so that I could understand like, what my rights were as a deaf person. And I just carried that with me. Fortunately, from when I was a little kid all the way to maybe my first or second year of college, I didn't really have to fight that much. My parents were able to help me with that because I was still young. But once I started getting older in college and I was starting to go off on my own, I had to fight for my rights. Um, the funny thing is, like, whenever you say, I'm not going to start the ADA law, people start to get terrified. Um, they kind of bend into your wishes. <laughs> I find that to be very true. Like, if you're asking for accommodation or whatever, if you don't mention the ADA, they're like, yeah, 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 whatever. But once you mention the ADA, they're like, oh, oh, we got to do something. My advice to everybody that's deaf or hard of hearing or had a disability is to make sure that you read about your rights and you understand what your rights are. Look it up online or print it out, take it home, memorize it, get to know it because that's what's going to help you get where you want to be. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I guess we'll close with some. Um, Questions about consumer education. You mentioned that soon you're going to be a nurse practitioner and I'm sure you'll be seeing patients and talking about ways in which they can take care of themselves, um, their health, their physical health, their mental health, spiritual health, uh, behavioral health. Um, 
So what advice do you have for deaf and hard of hearing community members out there about taking care of themselves, general uh, health advice about uh, things that they should be monitoring? Um, and uh, what kind of advice do you have for them? Just general health advice. Um, I guess my first thing that I would say is if you have a deaf and hard of hearing provider in the community, to go see them because not only are you supporting our first medical providers, you're also doing yourself a good service because you have someone that understands your journey and your health. Um, I have to say, for a lot of um, deaf and hard of hearing people is to look at your mental health because we grow up in a society where there's a lot of stigma and there's a lot of discrimination and we're often put down because people don't understand or they don't want to deal with us. So just make sure that you're watching your mental health because that's very important. You have um, your mental health, you have spiritual health, you have physical health. It's not just your blood pressure. It's your mind and your body and your soul. And you want to take care of all those things. Um, the more advice is like, if you don't understand what your provider is saying or you don't understand the nurse, don't just take it. You should ask for that interpreter or ask them to write it down or ask them to get a transcribing app. Don't just go to appointments where you don't have accommodation and then you end up getting a prescription that you have no idea anything about. If you really don't understand your diagnosis or your prescription, you have the right to ask. Don't just leave the doctor's office not knowing. As a provider, I'm very able to just sit there and talk to you for another 30 minutes and tell you why I'm giving you um, this blood pressure medication or whatever. I know that I have six, seven, eight more patients, but if you need that extra time, I'll take that extra time. A lot of times people assume that doctors or nurse practitioners or PA, um, they're impatient. It's not really that, it's just that we have a lot of patients to see and they only give us 15 minutes to see that patient. But if you ask and you're clear and you say, I don't understand this, can you please explain? Most of them will take that time to explain. So I think that I understand that a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people have great distrust in the medical community and they don't trust their doctors and nurses and whatnot. Um, I think they would do a good service to themselves to help, help educate those doctors and nurses by asking them to take that extra mile and take that extra step can you give me those accommodations? Can you step with me for those minutes and tell me what this means? So I think sometimes you just have to take that extra step. A lot of people don't want to do that, but this is your health that you're talking about. If you want to live to 100, you have to take positive steps to live to 100. Right. If I didn't want, if I wanted to die at 35, I would not go to the doctor at all. I would not take my blood pressure medication, you know stuff like that. So I think both the um, hearing community, the providers, the doctors, whatnot, and the deaf community have to make the extra stuff to make things better for the deaf and hard of hearing patients. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you wanted to add uh, to uh, our conversation today before we close? Um, I don't think so. I feel like I talked to that. <laughs> Which is great. Um, thank you so much for supporting our work here in Rhode Island. If folks want to reach out to you and contact you, um, is it all right if we post your contact information at the end of this video? So if folks want to reach out with any questions, they can? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Hey, they can email me. I don't really use the phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we appreciate your time uh, and um, supporting our work here in Rhode Island as a part of our HSTP grant. And uh, we wish you all the luck in, in the future in becoming a nurse practitioner. And we look forward to seeing 
all of the amazing things that you're gonna do in the future. And next time I see a helicopter up in the sky, some kind of uh, life star helicopter, I'll think, okay, Sarah's up there somewhere, <laughs> or will be eventually. <laughs> oh, I remember one thing that I wanted to talk sure. about. Sorry. Um, I guess I have two more goals that I would like to tell other deaf and hard of hearing providers and medical students, nursing students, whatever. And one of my goals is to start setting up um, disability health centers throughout the United States where everything is accessible for deaf, blind, we assure you that everything you have an ASN an interpreter at all times. So I think that's something that us collectively could establish. I'm hoping that I can do that myself here in Michigan, but we'll see. We'll have to stay tuned. And then the other project that I wanted to work on that I invite other staff and partners here and medical students, um, nursing students, whatever, is maybe we could apply for a grant, like a travel grant, where we can go to different countries around the world and to help educate their health care system, how to help the deaf and hard of hearing patient. I went to Kenya last year um, with my nursing school, and I did ask a little bit what happened to the deaf and hard of hearing people there. I didn't really get like, a big picture, but it kind of down like they bought the request. Mm. So I would like to work on those two projects because I feel like that's something that really needs to happen. Yeah. Well, I have no doubt you'll be successful and you'll actually make that happen. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> thank you so much, Sarah, for your time today. And thank you, Carol, for interpreting. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing where you go in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.